Hi everyone, I'm back. Uh, today we're going to fly Gus Grissom's Liberty Bell 7 flight. And uh, I have changed a few things around. Um, I got a few comments on one of the forum threads about how the how laggy the game was and we got into talking about computers and stuff. But uh, I tried setting the resolution down a bit. We're going to see how that helps things. I think it improves performance. You guys will have to let me know in the comments whether you like the better visuals from the last one or the performance in this one. Personally, I think I like the performance better. But that might just be me. You can see I turned down the texture a little bit over here on the Moon or Bust. Um, graffiti, I guess you could call it. Okay, so we are going to go out to the pad here and fly the second mission of the Mercury program. Once again, we're using one of the excellent FASA FASA rockets. These are really well done. I think they're really a treat to fly, and they're pretty. They're easy to fly too. Uh, a lot of modded parts, especially some of the bigger ones, are very difficult to fly, and some of that's dependent on the engine itself. But uh, I, I find that it's nice. Uh, it's especially with the smaller rockets to um, play around with some of the modded parts because you can see what the differences are. And uh, it, it really makes a difference, I think, in the realism when you can fly with real-world rocket parts. So, okay, this, uh, this doesn't seem to be loading very much faster. I'm a little surprised at that. Last time it didn't take this long. We will have to see. Well, we're getting there. I also turned up the volume quite a bit. I don't know if you can hear the in-game sounds. I thought they were kind of low on the last video, so you'll have to tell me what you think on that. So, here we go to the pad. Okay. Once again, we have uh, good old Jeb, Jeb Kerman. So we're going to do that. Okay, so, the second flight of the Mercury program was flown by Gus Grissom. Uh, he named his ship Liberty Bell 7 because he said that the spacecraft was kind of bell-shaped, and uh, they actually painted a white stripe along the side of it to signify the, uh, you know, the famous crack in the Liberty Bell. So, um, some more chat about that after the countdown. Let's go in three, two, one, ignition. See the launch is a little smoother with the lower resolution. Let's just see if that's too loud. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to try turning it down, actually. There, that's about twice what it was last time, so we'll see how that works. Okay, this is the second and final manned flight of the Mercury Redstone rocket. The, uh, this is essentially a direct parallel of Alan B. Shepard's flight, with one important exception at the end, which you'll see. Um, this was kind of just designed to test the spacecraft itself. The Mercury spacecraft uh, that Shepard flew in did not have this window up here. If we can zoom in, I guess we can't. This window here, it, uh, it had two portholes, but it didn't have a forward-facing window, which the pilots then requested on later ships, and they got it. The, uh, the window is actually kind of an interesting design. It's made of, of very high-strength plastic, and then there, it's double-layered. The inner window is actually made of three different parts, and uh, they're, they're fused together to form one pane. So there's no seam, from what I understand. It's, uh, it's, the, the end result is as strong as the rest of the rocket. And, um, I think it would be important to have a forward-facing video, or er, forward-facing window if I was going to fly one of these things. John Glenn later said that, uh, flying a Mercury capsule was more like wearing one. You didn't ride the rocket, you wore it to orbit. And uh, Glenn was always well known for being the face of the Mercury program. He, the public loved him, and he was uh, widely believed. It was widely believed that he would be the first man to, or the first American man to reach space. Not, not in fact, Alan Shepard. Jeb's enjoying himself as usual. Uh, I'm going to keep the camera down here, below the ship, uh, because I think it's kind of a nice view. You get the nice engine contrail here, and then. Uh, we also are not lagging. The the green numbers mean that the game's running at full speed, which is a nice change. 
So we're gonna see how this goes. Uh, I generally launch most of my bigger rockets from this angle anyway, but I'm gonna see, I'm gonna keep it here so we get the better performance. Once we're in orbit, we'll take a look at the planet and we'll see how much my resolution changes affected it. All right, I'm gonna begin my pitch over. And because our terminal velocity is so far ahead of us, we can never hit it anyway. Let's hit the gas pedal on this guy. Thousand meters per second over the surface. Yeah, it's not bad. Okay. So let's launch the escape tower. I actually did look that up. They launched it after the main booster had fired. Because there wasn't a need of it anymore. That makes sense. Okay, now we're going to ditch that. And I know that these are for retrofire. Uh, that's just a mistake that I made. But there's also a rocket that I don't think is modeled on here called the Positronic or something like that. It's uh, designed to put some separation distance. I'm pointing at the screen. Some separation distance between the capsule and the launch vehicle. While we're here, uh, John Glenn actually, or not John Glenn, Gus Grissom, who flew this flight, actually tried to look back at his capsule while he was, uh, or look back at his launch vehicle. He turned around in his seat, but he could actually not see it. And of course, uh, the pitch over at this point did not allow him to see it, so he never saw his his vehicle. So, in the interest of giving us a longer flight, I'm just going to fire our retro or our rockets now, put us a little farther in orbit. So this uh, would have been used as retro fire rocket, but since I fired it this way the first time, why not be consistent? And we'll get another couple of hundred meters per second of delta V out of it. You can see we're coming in, we're at about, okay, we're in space. We'll probably, yeah, bottom out at about 1,200 meters per second, which is not bad. Performance is a little better. It's smooth, anyway. I mean, yeah, the game knows we're lagging. But, uh, the ground looks better than it did in the last one. I mean, resolution is a little, is not quite there, but, uh, it's okay. Since I turned down the resolution, we won't be able to read some of this stuff on the capsule, but that's probably okay. I kind of want the performance rather than the ability to look at that. Okay, that's random. Oh, that's probably from our last flight. Okay, so our apoapsis isn't quite as good, but we should stay in space a little longer. That's okay anyway. I think uh, that some of the maneuvers uh, that Gus Grissom performed didn't actually pan out all that well, which is okay. Um, but like his pitch over or something, I, I think he did some yaw motions that didn't work out quite properly. So instead of uh, performing a roll maneuver like he was asked, why is that changing? It shouldn't be changing. Okay. Instead of performing some certain roll maneuvers like he was asked, the time allotted for his maneuvers was taken up by correcting for a yaw mistake. So instead, he just looked down at the planet. Can't see anything when you do that. Getting a little bit of lag. If I don't look at that part, it should be better. Yeah. You can see our uh, booster vehicle there. Oh, that's kind of that's kind of funny. That's actually true. Uh, Gus actually did see uh, some of the second stage positronic rockets. I don't think that's the right word, but I used it before, so I'm going to be consistent. He actually did see some of these rockets out of his window, which is kind of funny. I didn't plan that. But it worked out. Now, when Gus flew, there were clouds over southern Florida, and uh, he was unable to actually identify any landmarks until there was a break in the clouds that he could actually look down and see the cape. He was astonished at how clear the cape was. And uh, he didn't think that the distance... Of course, he was about 150 miles away. We are less than that. We're about 100 kilometers away, something like that. Oh, that's, that's really nice. That's what you get. I guess our uh, meter resolution. I'm surprised they took resolution out of that. That's bizarre. But anyway, the uh, our distance is less. They got up to an altitude of about 116 miles. Obviously, we are 
pass we already passed our apoapsis. But uh that's okay. It's a pretty accurate representation of what the rocket actually was, so Okay, I'm going to pass forward here. Again, we have throttling issues. Yeah, I think I like the low resolution better because the world is actually behaving. We're not watching a slideshow. This is actually pretty close to real time. See, we're actually getting some lag, but we're also flashing into the green numbers at the top left again. So we're doing okay. Jeb is clearly enjoying himself. Only man in space. And he's done the second flight. He's going to probably fly six times for us because I don't know how to edit the uh, files so that other guys get to fly. Let's get a little closer to the atmosphere. Turn off tracking now that we hit the atmosphere. So we can kind of bottom out there. Booster rockets still close. Our launch vehicle's way over here, well out of the range. It's actually going to be a bit of a shorter flight than our last one. The real uh, Liberty Bell 7 flight took about 15 seconds longer than Al Shepard's flight. So I think it was like 15.38 or something. It was about 15 seconds longer. We're not going to hit that. We may actually be slightly shorter because as you can see we are beginning to re-enter already. The ship is beginning to change its attitude. I'm not doing that. That's the ship doing that. My hands are off the keyboard and they have been since uh, we completed our roll maneuver. Coming in here, beginning to flatten out. I'm going to turn on our tracking for a sec so that that is about where the ship is actually pointed instead of the whole thing oscillating back and forth. Apparently there were some real oscillations in Gus Grissom's flight, but uh, we're not going to worry too much about that. There will probably be some as we go through the atmosphere anyway. Okay, coming up on the... Uh, on the re-entry burn here, or rather re-entry plasma sheath. I'm going to turn around so we can see the bottom of the craft, because I think this is the best view for re-entries. You can see we are getting some oscillation there, and the plasma sheath is starting to form. That really is cool. <laughs> I really like that. That is really cool. Okay, let's drop this off. Again, with the sticking the ship out of here. There, there are, there are oscillations. We're historically correct. You can see they did a nice job with the parachute. Of course, if we had full rendering on, we could see that. And it's warning me. So we might as well fire the chute. Yeah, we're going to have the chute open in about 9 minutes. We're not going to hit 15. Parachute dynamics are modeled really nicely though. We can enjoy that. Still watching a bit of a slideshow when we pan around, but you can see we're actually running in pretty close to real time, even though we're looking at the oceans. Uh, you'll see that when we get to the Apollo stage of this series, we won't have any of those issues, and I can turn the resolution up a little higher, because we're not actually looking at the Earth, or Kerbin, I guess. We're looking at the moon, and there's no ocean on the moon for the game to, red uh, for the game to render, so we don't have that issue. Just coming in here. Rescue copters would be on the way if we had a rescue copter. That's okay. When we hit end flight, who knows what happened. There we go. It's a nice shot.
Oh, that's kind of cool. I never actually did that before. I think in future launches I will actually start the rocket on the pad. If uh, people have objections to that, let me know. I can continue the way I've been doing this, but I think it'll save us some time in the videos. I can see I'm hitting about 15 minutes now. Speed up a little bit. Yeah, we're going to be well short of even our 12 and a half minute mark. Are we going to hit 11? Looks like it. Well, that's just because I had a flatter trajectory. Well, you'll be learning anyway. Our apoapsis was a little lower this time, so... Okay. Watch our splash time here. Got some splash zone effects here. Now, here's what made this a big difference from Liberty Bell, or rather Freedom 7. This is Liberty Bell. Gus ended up laying on his left side in the spacecraft, and he uh, he asked the rescue copters to hold off a minute or two, so he could, I think it was like five minutes, so he could jot down his cockpit readings. But uh, shortly before he got picked up, the cockpit hatch blew open. And Gus ended up swimming in the ocean. Or, in our case, flying above the ocean. That works too. <laughs> Hello, Jim. There we go. Yeah, um... This was always a point of contention with Gus. He said he didn't purposefully blow the hatch. And NASA engineers later proved him right. The hatch could blow by himself. This later would have some rather unfortunate and tragic consequences for Gus and uh, some of his colleagues. But uh, Liberty Bell 7 ended up sinking to the bottom of the ocean and then um, contained that he didn't blow the hatch and it turns out he was right. And Wally Shira later remained in his capsule and purposefully blew the hatch out on the deck to prove that when, they, when the pilots blew out the hatch, they would have a bruise on the side of their hand, which is uh, something Gus did not have. So that helped exonerate Gus. Okay. Next up, we're going to have the first American man in orbit, Gus Christmas flight on the Mercury Atlas rocket. See you then.